Okay. okay. Uh, we were talking about uh, we we're talking about uh, prevention of violence in the workplace. There are strategies that um, that companies can use to uh, defuse situations well before it actually escalates into any sort of incidents of violence or problems. There are, and, and that same type of prevention and training takes place for drug abuse, alcohol uh, abuse for um, individuals that are prone to be violent, and it, it really uh, involves training supervisors and providing awareness to employees that they have a right to be in a safe place, and that even if their friend, if someone they're worried about is uh, maybe taking excessive alcohol or an illegal drug or very angry, their intervening is an act of love and friendship. And while initially that person may be disciplined or may be counseled or may be even taken off the job for a period of time, these, these problems are diseases of denial that are not self-curing. And someone that's going to explode in the workplace, someone that's going to be taking drugs into the workplace, these are just bombs ready to go off. And intervention is critical. Training supervisors and employees in how to intervene and what to look for when intervention is appropriate is a major responsibility, and many employers are now doing that. So supervisory training is very important. And you've just branched into another area that's of importance in states like Illinois where there is legalized gambling, and that's uh, working with gambling addiction. It is. Uh, gambling addiction, uh, again, involves a pattern of behavior that's not uh, safe for the individual. Uh, many people can gamble, most can, without uh, uh, adverse consequences. But there are some individuals who not only bet over their head, but continue to do so at the risk of losing uh, their own financial security and that of their family. So we have helpline services that are available to anyone calling within the state of Illinois uh, on an 800 number to reach a counselor 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And uh, those phones are right outside this office with a group of counselors that man them. And the, the objective here is to give people an opportunity to stop that behavior and to find meetings, whether it's Gamblers Anonymous or individual therapy sessions with counselors or with family groups that would enable them to, to stop that pattern of behavior. Uh, in this case, the uh, gambling helpline is financed by the uh, Illinois Riverboat Casinos themselves. And that's uh, appropriate because they want to have people uh, patronize their institutions and those boats who do not put themselves at great risk. Uh, and. Uh, that program's been in existence for two years. Other uh, elements that uh, probably should do the same would include the racetracks and the bingo parlors and the sports betting and the uh, activities. The state lottery does have a, a commitment and is funding a helpline as well. Uh, the Illinois Department of Lottery does print an 800 number on the back of every lottery ticket. And uh, people engaged in that activity generally are hoping to win the lottery, but generally aren't investing more of their funds than they can afford to. But if they do, there's a place they can get help. You've been in a unique position from the standpoint of working in corrections and drug enforcement uh, to see the societal costs of drug addiction, alcoholism. I've seen some recent figures in terms of the people in prisons in the United States of the 1.7 million that are incarcerated currently something like 1.4 million have had problems with drugs or alcohol and are there as a direct result of that. Um, is there, what more can the country be doing to curb this? Well, I think it can be doing a lot more in education, treatment and prevention of drug and alcohol abuse and it can be consistent in its application of both enforcement and public policy. Uh, sadly, drug abuse control is cyclical. Unfortunately, it tends, as you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, Jack, to be political in the sense that it's fashionable to talk about it now. An election is coming up. We can be tough on the drug traffickers or we can provide funds to try to reduce crime and 
then it, it fades away, and you don't hear people talking about it every day. And what more can be done is to, to recognize that this is society's problem. And the police are alone are not going to solve it. It's going to take ministers. It's going to take coaches. It's going to take teachers. It's going to take parents. It's going to take students. It's going to take employers, labor unions, community organizations, everyone, to recognize the drugs are unhealthy, they're unsafe, and they change behavior. You're going to be talking at SIU Carbondale later this year at a conference sponsored by the Law School and the Public Policy Institute about many of these issues. And, and one of the things that they're going to be talking about in particular is aftercare for people who have gone through the prison systems, who are there presently, and what uh, can be done for them afterwards in terms of follow-up treatment. Uh, the, there seems to be a sense that we've dropped the ball there. We're not doing the kinds of things we need to for the people uh, who have the problems. I think that's a very key point, and I do think the return from an institution is critical, whether it's a prison or whether it's a rehabilitation center. Uh, you can re maintain relative safety in terms of no drug use or alcohol use uh, in an institution, uh, although it's increasingly uh, challenging for the administrators to keep drugs and alcohol out. But getting home, being back in that community where there are the former stresses and challenges and some of the problems that are in our environment, that's the key. And I do think the SIU conference will be a good opportunity to talk about halfway houses back into the community after prison or alternatives that can provide safety to the community but an opportunity for someone to uh, provide for greater control over this behavior. I think, I think this, this country sees a lot too much violence on television. I think our children at 3 and 4 in the afternoon, uh, 5 and 6 at night, 8 in the morning, they see more TV by the time they graduate from high school than they spend in high school, grade school, elementary school altogether. And that television is fraught with violence, it's fraught with uh, shootings, it's fraught with killings. And you never see a funeral. Someone's killed, that's just an act, and they go on. A gun is discharged, someone is killed, a bad guy, a good guy, but there's no grief. We don't see what's happened to that person's family. We don't see the funeral. We don't see the cost of, of the loss of that income producer. And it becomes uh, accepted. And it becomes something that is shown to attract people to go to a, a movie theater. The previews. Uh, to me are outrageous because you can rarely see a preview of a picture without uh, a violation of some laws or some basic standards of behavior. And I think that's one of the challenges as we continue to find technology and outlet in this country that uh, we need to listen more, we need to go slower, we need to s kind of censor what goes on in the television set. And when I say censored, with zoning as we do in a, in, a, in a commercial city where you don't have sludge and debris poured into your streets. Well, the streets that our kids are walking are the television sets that they're seeing. And I, I, I worry about drug and alcohol abuse and violence because it is also a, a factor in life as we see in our entertainment industry. I worry about it because we have uh, families that are dual income families. We have parents that may not spend as much time as, as they need to seeing what their children do, listening to their children, talking to them. Uh, we'll have challenges because even in our schools we're finding guns and violence and drugs and alcohol and we're seeing a, a generation that is growing up with trying to experiment and trying to uh, test their vulnerability. And the tools they test with now are guns and drugs and alcohol and sex and cigarettes, all of which are pretty unhealthy. Your advice to parents? Learn about these. Educate yourself first and then be a parent. 
provide love, but also provide parameters, boundaries. Know where your children are at 10 and 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock at night. And know where you are. And, and, and recognize that uh, it's okay to be the only parent in this block that says no. You can't have a party if I'm not home. If I'm not home, what's going to happen are those other kids are going to bring the liquor right into our house. A couple of general questions to wrap up. Peter, what's next for you professionally? What, what new directions do you see your, your company taking and you personally? I think the company will continue to provide uh, services to employers and organizations uh, that deal with people problems. Uh, I don't see myself uh, taking on a new role in, in government or private industry. I'm looking forward to spending time as a grandfather. I've enjoyed that tremendously the last several years. Uh, and I do continue to, to look forward to participation in civic activities. Children's Memorial Hospital has taken a lot of my time, and I've been uh, uh, very committed to trying to provide uh, at least one voice for uh, health care for children regardless of their ability to pay for young children. Uh, and also with the Commercial Club of Chicago, which is a group of, of civic individuals, of mostly business and some educational and political leadership that could uh, address some of the major problems of the Chicagoland area, which include education, which include housing, which include taxation. And uh, I think I'll be busy enough in the years to come. No doubt. Um, I'm curious, I as you look back, what, uh, what accomplishments have given you the most satisfaction? I think if I could answer that, what came to my mind when you started to ask the question was my gratitude for the opportunity to work in state government that was afforded me by Dick Ogilvie. And I think I'm most grateful for that. I'm grateful for the support of my wife, Judy, who's a doctor of medicine and deals with the problems of adolescence, and her support because when we were engaged, I was at Brunswick Corporation, and she thought, well, this is probably someone that's going to be working in private sector, and I'll be able to practice my medicine. And off I go to Springfield as one of 700 administrative assistants. Uh, I think the feel, what I feel best about is, is the team that I joined. I'm very grateful. I'm very humble. I feel really like I was lucky to be part of wonderful teams. Dick Ogilvie's team, uh, the team at the Department of Corrections with dedicated individuals, the team at the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the team here at Bensinger DuPont, we've got wonderful counselors that care about people. And somehow or other, uh, it's just worked. Um, in specific assignments, I could give you a laundry list of laws that we've passed or crooks that we put in jail and the Pablo Escobars and things like that. But really, I, what I feel best about is that relationship and that, that sense of, of, uh, of teamwork and, and common mission. What was your reaction when you, when you learned that you'd been nominated for the Lincoln Award? Shock. Surprise. I'd been to some Lincoln dinners. Uh, I was uh, honored by that because I, I'm an Illinois native. I grew up in Chicago, and I've, I've really lived most of my life in, in Illinois and thought about it um, as home. Mm -hmm. And it's a, an award that I've seen others receive that I've respected. I did, I did feel good about the fact that someone in corrections, someone in law enforcement, uh, someone in uh, a human relations service like employee assistance and drug and alcohol counseling uh, somehow has this recognition. Maybe not me mm -hmm. as much as the path that I follow. Well, thank you very much for your work. and certainly for your time today. Much good luck to you. Well, we can all use good luck, but I, I thank the Lincoln Academy and SIU for providing uh, the opportunity for, for me to be part of a, a broader scene with other laureates whose uh, accomplishments and contributions, believe me, I very much respect and admire. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope that the, the effort that the airways provide on, on communication of some of these issues uh, uh, does help. We do need certainly more awareness about some of these problems. I believe you on that. Well, this will this uh, this will air. Uh, the Lincoln program will be on 
all of the public TV stations in the state, from TTW here all the way down to our shop in Carpenter. That's 11 of us. And uh, the longer half-hour program, the, the interview program, will be on both our station in Carbondale and Almy, so you'll get at least the southern third of the state there. So. Good. Thank Thanks you. very much. I, this was wonderful. A, it's been a very uh, easy process for me. Your questions have provoked uh, uh, comments on subjects I care a lot about. Well, thank you. You know what I have to do again? I'm just going to... Thanks for doing this. We certainly appreciate it. Okay. You need a little higher there? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, Mr. Benzinger, thanks very much for the opportunity to do this. Been looking forward to it. I'd uh, like to begin, uh, always ask the laureates at the outset, about, uh, about growing up. What were some of the values that, that you picked up as a, as a young person that, uh, that set you on your way? I think family uh, was a key value, thinking about my brothers and my parents, uh, my grandparents. I think uh, in school, uh, a sense of challenge. Uh, I felt uh, natural working hard, um, and I was motivated uh, to do that in academics and in sports, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed uh, both of those activities. Who, what did your parents do? Well, my father was in business, a kind of a traditional family business that has been in uh, our family for four or five generations. And he was a president of uh, Brunswick Corporation. Then it was Brunswick Balky Calendar Company, a real mm -hmm. small company. And my mother was a very active, energetic mother and social being. She loved to dance. She loved to go to parties, but she also gave a good deal of her time to civic organizations, charitable work, to uh, the Girl Scouts, to the Riverview Ramble, to the United Charities, to the Lyric Opera, the Field Museum. And she did this with interest. Uh, she uh, became active in those organizations, but I didn't sense it was just to show that she was busy in the community. She took an interest in other people. Uh, when I went away to school, I went to a preparatory school, which did have a big impact on me, and I'm grateful to, uh, to that school, Phillips Exeter Academy. I got involved in uh, some service work and uh, continued to do that at Yale University, uh, starting uh, to work with people that were handicapped with cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy and uh, spoke on Monday nights to this group of eight or 10 or 12 people. And I didn't have a course outline and didn't have a master's degree or wasn't involved even in social work, but I, I felt good about that activity and it probably set a, a pattern for me to be aware of a, a larger community around, around me and around uh, where I was living. Set you on a path toward pub eventual public service. Yes, it did. I, I worked uh, for 10 years for, for Brunswick and then left, uh, never to return, but to, uh, to work in, in a different career path that involved uh, criminal justice, law enforcement, corrections, rehabilitation, and more recently, in uh, employee assistance program and helpline services. I'm curious about how, uh, how you departed from the family business to go into uh, starting into law enforcement and public safety corrections. What uh, I, I'm curious as to how that happened. It happened because the governor-elect in 1968 was Richard Ogilvy. Okay. And Dick o Ogilvy had gone to Yale, and I heard him speak. I wasn't active in politics, and I hadn't been uh, really involved at all. But uh, in 1968, during the campaign, I went to a couple of meetings, heard him speak, and. He recruited 18 different people, mostly businessmen, after the election to prepare for his state government. And I became one of the members of the transition task force. And I took a one and a half month leave of absence from Brunswick, thinking that I would then go back. But uh, the challenge I found, the people I met, the opportunities to make change with Dick Ogilvy's leadership 
it was an easy decision. And uh, I did become an administrative assistant in the Department of Public Safety, one of seven or eight hundred. And if you'd have asked me uh, if I was planning to go on to DEA or to be the head of the prison system or the Chicago Crime Commission, I would have said, you've got to be kidding. But I did find uh, the challenge of what needed to be done uh, very great. I turned in a report which was given to the incoming director of the Department of Public Safety, Herb Brown. And uh, Director Brown said to the governor, look, this Ben Singer has been studying this for two months. He's given us a lot of recommendations. I'd like him to be my administrative assistant. And uh, I accepted. Dick Ogilvie was such an innovator in state government. He's, he's been called the father of modern Illinois government. What was it like to be in his administration? Wonderful. He was the best CEO I've ever worked for. And that includes uh, lots of presidents and attorney generals. But he was very clear in his direction. He delegated authority uh, effectively. He held people accountable. But he also gave them backing and encouragement. And uh, it was exciting. In uh, the corrections field and the public safety field, we were coming out of the dark ages, really. Uh, and there were other people. Uh, my age, I was 32 at the time, and uh, John McCarter and George Ranney and Dan Carney and Brian Whalen and a host of other individuals were uh, also involved in leaving their occupations and going into state government at the same time. Dick Ogilvie's administration is known for the innovations and the uh, reforms that it instituted, particularly in the Department of Corrections. You said that it was coming out of the dark ages. What was corrections like when you came there? Well, it was uh, not really up to the 20th century, or certainly 1968. There was no Sunday visiting at the state penitentiaries. They were all generally um, being run in a very controlled fashion that also reflected the age of the penitentiaries. We hadn't built a new penitentiary in Illinois since 1918. Stateville, Pontiac, uh, 1971. Menard, 1871. Right. Uh, Menard, 1856. Uh, Joliet, 1860s. These were buildings 100 years old. And as a consequence, the, the programs that were available to the inmates was limited. The pay was low. There wasn't major staff training. There was a, an absence of uh, affirmative action and minority uh, recruitment. Uh, the salaries uh, attracted barely high school graduates, if that. And we had a, a system that provided training for some inmates to be barbers or to be plumbers, but they couldn't get licensed in these professions because of licensing restrictions. And going to Dick Ogilvie was a, a great great feeling because we could change. We changed 59 laws and repealed the licensing laws. So we started Sunday visits. Obviously, that's when families of offenders have the best opportunity to come and visit. Uh, we opened up the letter writing. We established grievance procedures. We promoted major changes in salaries for the correctional officers, brought in universities, had a full-time pardon and parole board established a unified code of corrections. Dick Ogilvie was one of the leading governors in the country to uh, spearhead uh, correctional reform and receive recognition for it. I was the person that was in that job to make change. And maybe because I hadn't been involved in corrections or hadn't been a warden and hadn't been a psychologist, mm -hmm. I was able to ask questions that others hadn't because they hadn't realized it, it could be done. How did that set the tone for you moving on to other positions in law enforcement like the Chicago Crime Commission and then, of course, as a stepping stone in, into Washington? I think it gave me an opportunity to work with people I believe were tremendously dedicated. Uh, I think it gave me experience in dealing with crisis. We had disturbances, riots at penitentiaries. We had, uh, at the time of Attica, to deal with the aftermath of what inmates were feeling. We didn't lose... Uh, a correctional officer in, during the course of Governor Ogilvie's administration in the adult penitentiary system. We had one uh, correctional supervisor 
that was killed at the Sheridan School for Boys and the Youth Commission. But I was certainly challenged with dealing with the unexpected, dealing with the difficult problems of, of corrections and the challenge of rehabilitation and the challenge of bringing uh, a staff that was used to a, a different philosophy uh, into the 20th century and, and working with outsiders. I was fortunate to, to find uh, people like Carl Menninger and Norval Morris and Ben Meeker and Tom Einan to serve on an advisory committee and to recruit knowledgeable correctional administrators like Joe Coughlin and Bud Monahan uh, to uh, serve as assistant directors. And uh, I, I just uh, felt good about the, the people and the mission and the task. And as I went on to other assignments, that sense of confidence, that sense of, of uh, opportunity to make change stayed with me. When did your focus start to change toward drug enforcement? Well, I was interested in the problems of drugs and alcohol, even as a correctional administrator. We started the first uh, drug rehabilitation program in the state, maybe in the country, at the uh, DARE program in, in Stateville Penitentiary. And we had a work release center and a halfway house uh, for drug offenders uh, in Illinois' prison system back in the 1970s. So I was interested in the problems of drugs. We certainly dealt with uh, the problems of drug traffickers in the penitentiary system and in the Illinois Youth Commission, which was in fact, my first assignment uh, as a state officer. Uh, in law enforcement, I saw uh, at the Chicago Crime Commission the major problems in the narcotic courts, uh, which turned to be a, a revolving door. And when the DEA assignment presented itself to me, and I felt uh, certainly comfortable in this mission. I believed we need a, a strong deterrent in the United States and in this world uh, to have a force against uh, the trafficking and abuse of drugs. You were coming into that job at a time when the country was just coming out of Vietnam, the whole uh, drug culture was popularized in, in music and in so many ways. Uh, what was the task like when, when you came to Washington? Did you feel as though that uh, there was a lot said against you in terms of how the country was feeling about drugs, or, or what was it like? It was like uh, that, as you've described it, but uh, I was the third administrator in three years, and the DEA was under some pressure and some criticism. And I was uh, sought out, I think, and selected, not because I had been in the law, I wasn't an attorney, the prior administrators were, nor necessarily a police officer. I had been a, an administrator of a large public agency in the state of Illinois and had insights into the problems of crime from that perspective and as director of the Crime Commission. At DEA, I found a, an, an agency, an organization that was somewhat demoralized, whose mission was challenged by some that didn't know whether we should, in fact, have strong drug laws, and by a Congress and media that needed to be educated and that we needed to tell people what our problems were. So I went out of my way when there was a problem. If there was a, uh, an event that was not uh, to the liking of anyone, to make sure it was known. And uh, talked to Congress and told them, we have major problems. This is not a minor problem. This is a, a very serious threat to the, to the fiber of this country and its people. And as a consequence, we got a select committee. When I say we, it was uh, certainly something I welcome. And many administrators don't want congressional committees looking over their shoulders. But I found that was an opportunity to turn this congressional committee into spokesmen, to people that could talk about the problems of, of drug trafficking in this country. And we changed laws, we increased our budget, we got better support. And we had a, a, a real sense of comradeship between the administration, first the Ford administration, and then Carter administration, and the Congress. And that was a, a good thing to do. It's a highly political post um, in that uh, you're the front person for the administration in many respects, or, or the country, really. Um, how did 
you say that you say that you turned that around and used it to your advantage. Um, did you find that there were pressures to have you do things that uh, or take stands that you didn't particularly want to take? How, how did you deal with that? Well, it wasn't political in the sense of a Democrat or Republican political. It wasn't political in the sense that you had to. Uh, do a lot of favors for a party to get the job or once there decide who to arrest and who to investigate and where to put your emphasis and no president that I worked for told us or gave us signals as to say well don't pay any attention in North Carolina and we want more agents in, in Spain instead of in Mexico or uh, don't appear on this television show uh, the, the politics was to confront the problem and recognizing that it's not going to be solved like a next day challenge. It's not like a football game. It's not even like a, a world war which you have a beginning and a middle and an end. This is a continuing battle. And our objective is to curb drug abuse, to reduce the exposure of the American people to the violence associated with it and the addiction. Not to sense that well, we're going to cure it tomorrow. And that's the challenge that you have as an administrator of that agency. And to get the state and local people to, to work with you. Uh, traditionally, some of the federal agencies have tried to take the spotlight. They have most of the money, they have the media, they have a national scope, they have broader jurisdiction. But most drug arrests are made by local police officers, 90% of them. And most of the challenge in violence is also at the local level. So I, I felt one of the first steps I could take was to try to build a partnership domestically and internationally with the counterparts of DEA. We worked real hard to do that. Had conferences with their chiefs and with their commanders and put task force together in the cities and uh, recruited uh, cooperation from the international community, providing training, providing meetings, providing equipment, providing expertise. And this was one of the major missions that I thought needed to be done. What describe describe, if you will, the, the, the challenge in working beyond the borders of the United States because you're dealing with entirely different governments, entirely different political points of view, uh, different political realities all the way around. Um, what sort of diplomatic skills had to be exercised in that? Considerable, Jack, because I think the United States at least in the 1970s and 80s wanted to blame the drug problem on foreign countries. This isn't our problem, it's because Mexico or Turkey or, or Thailand or Burma or Colombia aren't doing their job. And if there was an arrest made, it was easy for the Americans to say, well, we, we really engineered this. U.S. agents don't have law enforcement authority in foreign countries. We can provide intelligence, we can provide support, we can provide uh, equipment, we can provide cooperation, and we need to do all of that. But it's the foreign law enforcement agency that is going to make the arrest and has to make the arrest. So I think the, the challenge is to give them credit, pat that leader on the back and not try to steal the spotlight. I think when they don't cooperate, and we found in Bolivia that the Minister of the Interior was on the take, and we found in Colombia a great deal of corruption, that was just at the end of my administration, uh, that you then have to see the State Department take a higher role. And if they're unwilling to do that, that's unfortunate. That was one of the frustrations of that job, and one of the frustrations even today in international drug law enforcement. They just had a an election change in Colombia, and I'm looking for improved results to come as a result of it. But if the State Department says, well, narcotics is not the top of our agenda, it's having a vote at the UN Security Council or a, in the national uh, meetings that take place, international meetings that take place at the UN, as compared to saying, if you don't cooperate with us on narcotics, we're not going to buy your products and we're not going to support you. Then, you, then you have problems. What are you proudest of in, in what you were able to accomplish at DEA? I think generally a reduction in heroin. The overdose death rate was running about 2,000 a year. The tonnage of imports was about six or seven tons. And that dropped to an overdose death rate of less than 800. 
and imports uh, of perhaps one and a half tons. The number of addicts was cut by 40 to 50 percent. Uh, we established much better cooperation with state and local law enforcement and international cooperation and uh, put in the forfeiture laws which uh, enabled the government, state and local, to take the assets, the profits from the drug trade and uh, take them away from the people that were uh, getting these ill-gotten gains and making millions from someone else's addiction and death. What else would you have liked to have done before you left the post? I think had greater continuation of the parent group movement and uh, drug and, and uh, alcohol education is still needed. Uh, right then in the 80s we did have Nancy Reagan who was a very effective spokesperson on this issue and uh, I think had that initiative continued through the end of the 80s, end of the 90s to today, we'd have less drug abuse in this country. I think the potential merger and affiliation with the FBI and DEA was disconcerting for a couple of years uh, and the mission was not internationally focused as it needs to be uh, continually. But I think at DEA uh, the administration felt it was time for a change. They wanted to try some uh, FBI uh, uh, cooperative efforts and uh, certainly they were entitled to do that. I'd been there longer than any other administrator and probably uh, found that with a new administration they have their own people and can probably pour more resources into that agency if it's headed by someone that uh, has a loyalty and a, an allegiance to that a new leader or that new attorney general. You turned your attention to addressing the, uh, the demand side when you left the administration and uh, developing philosophies and strategies like the drug-free workplace. Tell me about how that, uh, how that took root. It took root really in recognition even while I was at DEA that we may have problems within our own organization of 4,500 employees with drugs and alcohol. We started an employee assistance program, the first one in the Department of Justice. I feel proud of that because it helped a lot of people and families, spouses, children, parents who were very stressed out about their uh, family members' career at DEA and the DEA agents themselves who had to live two lives, an undercover life and a life for their own family. And the sense of, of uh, a drug-free workplace concept emerged then. Uh, when I left DEA, I thought about what opportunities arise. And uh, someone I knew well asked me to come to Chicago, back to Chicago, which is home for me, and uh, consult with Commonwealth Edison on a potential drug problem at the Zion nuclear plant. And I did that. And uh, Jim O'Connor, who was the chairman, and also, I think, a Lincoln Laureate, if I'm not mistaken, right. uh, said, Peter, we, we don't know what we really have here, and I don't want you to come for one week and write a report. Stay months, and let's put a program together. And I did, and worked with a team of, of uh, managers and employees at Commonwealth Edison and put together a, a program, really their program, and I was just an advisor and helper and catalyst on drugs and alcohol in the workplace. And that saved lives, set a program policy for the uh, utility industry, and started me on a career in a new company. There's a philosophy that, that's at work here that, that's, that I think is very interesting. It doesn't, uh, it's, it's not one that says, well, if you're drinking, you're out of here. You use drugs, you're out of here. Uh, it works with people and saves the assets that the organization, the company, whatever, has, uh, has invested. The, the single biggest asset of any organization is its people. And that's what a good drug and alcohol policy will protect. That asset, it's the people that are involved in men and women in the organization. And providing an opportunity for rehabilitation makes sense. It's good business and it's, it's, it's uh, not only good for for humanity, but it'll help that individual and their family. I believe in drug testing. I've advocated testing to find out who is using illegal drugs. 
but that doesn't necessarily automatically mean they lose a job. They can be suspended and should be, disciplined and should be, if the policy clearly provides that, but given an opportunity to get treatment and help and to return to work. The idea of direct testing in the workplace is still controversial in many aspects. How do you feel about that? I think less controversial than it was uh, in 1982. The Supreme Court has ruled it's legal. A state and federal courts have uh, ruled it's legal. It needs to be done in the context of a clear written policy. It can't be arbitrary, capricious, or discriminatory. But if someone is seeking a job, it's reasonable for an employer to say, our policy is to have a drug-free workplace, and we don't want to hire people who automatically are in violation of that policy. So we are going to do drug testing. Our policy is to have a safe workplace. So if someone looks unsafe, a drug test will at least decide if drug use could have been one of the causes. And if it wasn't, that person continues. If it was, that person can get help. Ninety percent of the Fortune 500 companies utilize drug tests and utilize employee assistance programs, which is the other part of the, of the effort, and that's to provide help for people in trouble for a wide range of problems. Could be personal, could be financial, could be marital, could be family, could be eating disorders, but also could be substance abuse, drugs and alcohol. You've branched out since then to deliver any number of different kinds of programs in terms of, uh, I've seen uh, programs listed on stress, uh, depression, anxiety, um, up to and including uh, uh, programs to prevent violence in the workplace. And I'd like to ask about that a little bit because in recent weeks, recent months, we've seen some horrendous things happen, in not only in workplaces but in public schools. It's a major problem where you have an excess availability of, of handguns. Well, we have more federal gun uh, stores than we have gas stations in the United States. And uh, I'm not on a crusade necessarily on um, gun control alone, but I won't resist the opportunity to say I think we need more of it. And I think that handguns are a major problem, uh, particularly in the hands of people other than law enforcement officers, and I'm talking about parents and children, and employees. I think in terms of violence in the workplace, that's a, an exponent of some of the frustration and stress and anxiety that comes about when there's a loss of communication, either at home or at work. And uh, our company, Bensinger DuPont, doesn't provide treatment, per se. We don't run and operate a a rehabilitation center and we don't operate a drug testing lab but we do direct people to those resources and do have counselors that will do at least uh, motivational initial counseling to get people back on the right track employers can have programs that will address violence in the workplace and they can have a trauma debriefing program and a follow-up program and a counseling effort that will both be designed to prevent it and to be available if it happens. I'd like to stop for just a second because we need to change tapes. I got good. This is going very